Deuteronomy 18. The priests, the Levites, and all the tribe of Levi shall have no part nor inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the offerings of the Lord made by fire in his inheritance. Therefore shall they have no inheritance among their brethren. The Lord is their inheritance, as he hath said unto them. And this shall be the priest's due from the people, from them that offer a sacrifice, whether it be an ox or a sheep, and they shall give unto the priest the shoulder, and the two cheeks, and the maw, the first fruit also of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thy oil, and the first of the fleece of thy sheep shall thou give him. For the Lord thy God hath chosen him out of all thy tribes to stand to minister in the name of the Lord, him and his sons forever. And if a Levite come from any of thy gates out of all Israel, where he sojourned, and come with all the desire of his mind unto the place which the Lord shall choose, then he shall minister in the name of the Lord his God, and all his brethren the Levites do, which stand there before the Lord. They shall have like portions to eat, beside that which cometh of the sale of his partami. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth, useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a ne necromacer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou shalt possess hearkened unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. The Lord thy God will rise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken according to all that thou desireth of the Lord thy God in Horeb, in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will rise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou, and if thou say in thine heart, How shall we know the word? which the Lord hath not spoken. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the, thing, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Amen. Thank you, brother. Uh, Deuteronomy 18, continuing our study of the book of Deuteronomy. Every chapter, again, seems to have a, a, a certain theme to it, and this one's no different. Here, contrasting the Levites and that prophet with uh, these false, abominable, God-serving people and, and, and what have you, of these other nations, lowercase g, of course. We'll get right into it. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 1. The Bible reads, The priests, the Levites... And all the tribe of Levi shall have no part nor inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the offerings of the Lord made by fire and his inheritance. Therefore shall they have no inheritance among their brethren. The Lord is their inheritance, as he hath said unto them. Now that, of course, isn't a bad inheritance. Who wouldn't want to have the Lord as their inheritance? It certainly, though, does make things a little bit different, a little bit interesting for 
the Levites in general. They have no inheritance, the Bible says here in that first verse, with Israel. Okay, and so as a result, they're to eat the offerings of Israel's inheritance and those things which are offered by fire unto the Lord. So what's that mean? Essentially, all of Israel will have land and will work their land and will bring of a tenth or a tithe of their their, their, what they've gained from their inheritance that God has given unto them, and that will be given directly to the Levites that serve day and night always in the temple. On top of that, any of the offerings made by fire, now that's not just a tithe, that's separate. What the offerings would be then is, you know, if there's any kind of trespass made, or if there's any kind of free will offering, or any kind of above and beyond the tithe that is made, the Levites would also have part of that, and that was how they were to be kept and taken care of. All of the people round about were to support the Levites by blessing the Lord, and the Lord would then give that portion unto them, and that's how they were to be kept. Verse 3 continues and says, And this shall be the priest's due. The priest's due. Look down in verse 5. It says, For the Lord thy God hath chosen him out of all thy tribes, to stand to minister in the name of the Lord, him and his sons forever. And how that came to pass was essentially that when God demanded a tenth of all, he demanded also the firstborn and the first fruits as that tenth. Therefore, whenever a child was born into a house, a man child, that first man child of any tribe would be the Lord's. Now, instead of having all of these tribes give of their children their firstborn, and I think that would be a really hard thing, especially for a mama to do, right? He instead took a whole tribe to himself to represent sacrificially and substitutionally that um, first fruits offering unto him. God's a good God for doing something like that. The priests do because they were chosen out of these tribes to minister. So we see then God is being sure to care for his own people and care for those that even though he draws them out and gives them none of the inheritance, he has a special inheritance for them, and that's that they would be able to serve God day and night, and that they would be specially selected to have that role, and also they're going to have everything provided for them as well. Uh, Deuteronomy 18, verse 4, it says, the first fruits, oh sorry, we'll continue on in verse 3, we missed that one, it says, from the people and from them that offer a sacrifice, whether it be ox or sheep, and they shall give unto the priest the shoulder and the two cheeks and the maw, the first fruit of also of thy corn, of thy wine, of thine oil, and the first of the fleece of the sheep shalt thou give him. So the first fruits of the ox or the sheep, God specifically says that when he does so, when they offer so, what they would get would be the shoulder. Um, specifically, which would be your, your left, the left breast as well as the leg that goes down to it. The two cheeks are referred to here, and I believe that's actually the head. <laughs> the head, believe it or not, a very, a very, very fatty and sought after portion um, in that time and in that era. We don't think that we would want the head of an ox or of a sheep, but that was that was much sought after, and therefore it was given unto them. And also the maw, which is a portion of the stomach, the upper and frontal portion of the stomach, which again was very fatty, very flavorful. That was all to be the priest. So they're getting a good and hefty and, 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 and desired portion. Also on top of that, the first of the corn, the first of the wine, the first of the oil and any fleece that comes in. And so their clothing, their food is, is taken care of as the servants of God and above and beyond. They're getting the best cuts, it seems. So, so God definitely took care of his people, giving them the inheritance of himself, though withholding from them a different inheritance. Just because God's withholding a certain thing from you doesn't mean that he doesn't have something else special planned for you that makes you unique and different and gives you a special place in his heart. He's got a special place for every one of us. And here, he has chosen the Levites to sit in that particular seat. Verse 6, it says, And if a Levite come from any of thy gates out of all Israel with all the desire of his mind unto the place which the Lord shall choose... So it says here that he comes with desire, he comes with intent, he goes specifically to the place that the Lord 
shall choose. Now, I believe this applies to when he's traveling or if he's visiting, but specifically here in the context, it's if he's deciding to come up and dwell here among the 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 and in the place which God shall choose. In other words, he's going to reside where he's serving, is what he's saying here. The priest has decided instead of residing out in um, what is referred to as the suburbs, he's going to come and reside in the temple and where he is serving in the specific uh, location that God has chosen to place his name there. Verse 7 says, Then he shall minister in the name of the Lord his God. In other words, God would freely receive him. If he desires to leave behind a house and come and dwell in and near the house of God to serve there, then he shall certainly minister into the name of the Lord his God, as all his brethren the Levites do, which shall stand there before the Lord. Verse 8 says, They shall have like portions to eat besides that which cometh of the sale of his patrimony. Okay, so he is going to be able to minister the same as everybody else, with the same portions offered unto him that everybody else who is abiding there and serving there. On top of that, he is able to receive of the sale of his patrimony. Okay, so while the Bible is specific in saying that the Levites have no lot nor inheritance with the people of God. In other words, if you look at the map of old Israel, some of you have it in your Bible, there's going to be tribes in different areas. And if you look through it, you don't see anything for the Levites. That being said, there were specific suburbs, even in every community, where Levites would abide. And so Levites collectively, as a group, had no lot, had no inheritance among the people of God. But it does seem to indicate when it's talking about the sale of his patrimony, you know, if he's going to put off having that, that they could have land. So while they didn't inherit anything, they could definitely possess land. You can turn to Deut or Jeremiah chapter 32, and I'll talk about this a little bit. Keep your finger in Deuteronomy 18, and in Jeremiah chapter 32. And I do have a few examples. Solomon looked to Abiathar the priest and said, Get thee to Anathoth unto thine own fields. Also in Acts chapter 4 and verse 36 through 37, Barnabas, the Bible says, a Levite, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And so certainly Levites could have and possess and keep land. It's not like some of us thought, and I even thought until I really fell upon this and, and paid close attention to it, what in the world is patrimony, right? That's a possession of a land that they could sell as they come to abide close to the house of God, leaving behind the suburbs, right? They could own land. Barnabas is an example. Abiathar the priest, also a Levite, is an example of this. And here we have Jeremiah chapter 32. And you'll be looking in verse 6. And uh, it says, Jeremiah 32, and in verse 6, And Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, Hanamiel, the son of Shalom, thine uncle, shall come unto thee, saying, Buy thee my field that is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. So Hanamiel, mine uncle's son, came unto me in the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord, and said unto me, Buy my field, I pray thee, that is in Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine, buy it for thyself, then I knew that it was the word of the Lord. And if you were to go to Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 1, you don't have to go there. That whole book starts with the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. Jeremiah, a Levite, has the right to inheritance of a land that belonged to his uncle. And so therefore, they could have inheritance, though again, collectively, they did not possess the same type of inheritance of the other tribes of Israel. They were to serve God in their generations, and that was to be their lot and their inheritance. So Jeremiah here in prison has the right to redemption to buy his uncle Hanamiel's field, and he does so at the word of God. God tells him to do it, and then when basically that, that thing comes to pass, and someone comes and says, hey, you can go and buy this land now, he says, oh, it was the word of the Lord. And then there's a whole thing there about buying land, and it talks about how the contract was written and everything. And so here, Jeremiah, a Levite, even in prison, is buying land and, and uh, inheriting it in that way. 
Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 18. That's just a little aside if anyone was interested. I was interested to follow that because I always thought the Levites just, I don't know, were just homeless or something. I don't know what I had envisioned in my mind. Or they all just dwelt in like like uh, like bunk houses or something where there was just like bunk beds or separate things. Like they were just in the house of God all the time. Eventually the temple would be their house. I had no idea that they, you know, bought and owned land and, and that was okay and they okay to do so. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 18 and verse 9, the Bible continues and says, When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of these nations. So again, he keeps warning them. You're going to go into this land. There's going to be heathen there. Now God did promise that essentially as they marched in, God would remove out the people sending hornets before them, sending the fear of him before them, or whatever it took, so they wouldn't have to essentially fight any battles. But they definitely would come upon artifacts. They would come upon possessions and things and statues. They were to break them down, but God is always just reminding them, don't learn after these abominations. You're probably going to find books there, scrolls there. You're going to find writings there that show how they worship their gods. Get rid of this stuff. Don't follow after the abominations of these nations. Learn not after them, okay? Okay. Verse 10 then, down through 14, the Bible says, Thou shalt not be found among you, there shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer, for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God drive doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God for these nations which thou shalt possess hearkened unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee to do so. He hath not allowed thee, he has not permitted thee to just make up your own way of following after the spiritual realm. And this is interesting because you just find this huge list of different ways that they do engage with the spirits, don't you see? But God has already prescribed here in the beginning of this chapter the priests, the Levites. There is one way for God's people to actually get through to the spiritual world. Certainly they could cry out to God on their own, and that was always a, 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 a available. Anybody could cry out to God, and he would certainly hear. But in, in regard to religious ceremonies, religious rites, religious duties, it was always to be through the priest. That's why he set apart that tribe for himself. But here we have these other nations, and as the Bible describes of that strange whorish woman in the last days pictured as Babylon, her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. There is all sorts of ways that people get into contact with devils. All sorts of paths that people get involved in false worship and false gods. There's only two religions in this world. There's God's way through the Levites, and that's a singular path. The way, the truth, the life. That's it. Right Now we have direct access to Jesus because he abolished the system of the priest being come and high priest for us that we can go directly to. But in the other religion, it's just simply do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, isn't it? Isn't that the number one tenet of Satanism? Isn't that the number one way that essentially the whole world thinks? You can be an atheist and you still fall in line with the other religion. The other way to damnation is the only thing that it's going to get you. But that's what we find here. We find all of these lists of different ways that people try to get a hold of the gods, try to manipulate the spirits to do their biddings and to get their, get their satisfaction from them. The Lord does not suffer or allow his people that same uh, leave. He has one way, and he has always had one way, and he's always desired his people reach him one way. Here we have specifically some of the items. You should not have, verse 10, somebody, they're an abomination, who would have their son or their daughter to pass through the fire. You know what that is? That's ritual human sacrifice. They were more honest with it back in the day. The child would have to be born and they would have to bring it and witness it die. Now they just... You know, I guess we're more sanitary now or something. We, we go and we offer our children. We set them through the fire unto Moloch or unto false gods, unto the god of convenience. We do that by way of abortion now. It's the same thing. And these things are abomination.
condemnation. Certainly there's forgiveness for anyone who gets trapped up, tripped up, and caught up in these things when they are in ignorance and in unbelief, as would be for any of these. We have in our midst people who have dabbled in familiar spirits, who have talked to diviners, who have done these things in our day, right? Certainly we would put it was far away from us and we would condemn those practices now there is forgiveness of course but god here is setting forth a standard okay when we fall short of the standard god is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we'll just confess it that's okay right but these things are still the standard don't do them all that do so are an abomination ritual child sacrifice ritual human sacrifice causing children to pass through the fire is abomination unto god and all that do so are as well abomination useth divination is the next one that's that's seeking divinity or contact with divine supernatural beings trying to get insight it's often a dark art divination is what it is you're 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 always doing something in the shadows you're always doing some sort of dark secret act in order to conjure up that's divination an observer of times if you would you could go to deuteronomy 17 in verse 3 where it says and hath gone and served other gods and worshiped them either the sun or the moon or any of the host of heaven which i have not commanded thee so that when you're worshiping the sun the moon the host of heaven when you're seeking after these things to get an understanding you are observing times you are looking at the way that the stars move the way that the planets move the way that the sun and moon move and you're making presumptions about the future through that astrology is one of those things right where people try to gauge what they'll what type of person they will be or try to gauge what kind of decisions they ought to make based on that that's observing times it's an abomination unto god and those that do so are abomination as well or an enchanter now an enchanter, you've, you've enchanted me. Right? The enchanted kingdom is down there in Disney. What enchantment is, is a mind manipulation. It's a type of hypnotism. It's a, it's a type of convincing your mind of some sort of alternate reality. And that's what happens when people obviously go down to Disney and they're uh, interacting with princesses and ghouls and goblins and characters from fantasy land. They've been enchanted. Their mind has been manipulated. They've been hypnotized into a false reality. That's what an enchanter does. A witch witches use potions. They use trinkets. They use spells. They use different different uh different chants and 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 rituals in order to manipulate the spirit world that's what a witch is the bible says thou shalt not suffer a witch to live this is a big deal it's a big problem a charmer then is someone that delights or attracts you know prince charming oh he's so he's so charming that little twinkle in his eye i was charmed what a, what a charming woman what a charming man that's somebody that delights and attracts the affections it, it, it's sensual, the charmer, that draws somebody into a certain thing. Also, we have here consulters with familiar spirits. These are relative. These are spirits that know you. You know why they're familiar? They're like family spirits. This is why some people will go to any one of these different types. They'll go to a, a, a diviner. They'll go to an enchanter. They'll go to a witch. They'll go get their palms read. And then suddenly, they'll have revelations to somebody that are pretty clear that are pretty spot on oh your great aunt Flo is talking to me and she's saying this it's not great aunt Flo. if great aunt Flo was saved she's in heaven if she wasn't she's in hell now but what you have is a familiar spirit there's millions of them that hung out with aunt Flo, hung around the family learned lots of things eternal beings that aren't 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 kept by time aren't, aren't confined by time and so when these devil conjurers talk to that familiar spirit they'll get things that are very similar to what aunt flo would say do behave and know different secrets all oh, no one could know that but old aunt flo it's just nothing but a familiar spirit and we're not to go to these things and we're not to go after these spirits in order to get any kind of information it's abomination don't follow after these practices of engaging with the spirit world a wizard i believe that's just the male version of a witch and here in the necromancer that's one that communicates with the dead. That's one that is trying to conjure up the dead. That's one that is trying to raise the dead even. Right? The Bible records very clearly it's appointed a man once to die and after this the judgment. Certainly there were people that rose from the dead, but it was always the hand of God that did it. 
There is, I believe, in the last days going to be a resurrection of the dead. Necromancy in the highest level and the highest visibility of this world. All will see the one that had the deadly head wound yet did live. And whether that's by CGI or by computer enhanced image or on television or whatever, or whether we actually see it, resurrection from the dead is God's business and not man's business. So watch out for this type of thing. And watch out for all of these things because her ways are movable, thou canst not know them. The serpent is subtle, more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God thy made. And all of these different types of, of demonic practices are all around you every single day. They're creeping into churches. They're creeping into our own ideologies through television influences and through printed word influences or, or whatever. You're, you're, you're constantly being surrounded and inundated with these types of things. One day you may have to square off with practicers of these types of things. you got to be prepared. you got to be aware. God's not just throwing this out there as if it's just some sort of fantasy thing we'll never encounter. In the last days, I believe, as the Antichrist rise to power... He will cause craft to prosper by his laws which he makes. Causing craft to prosper, I believe that's none other than witchcraft, and I believe that's none other than the things that we're seeing here. The religion of the Antichrist in the last days could very well be a resurrecting of these types of practices, but not, you know, in, in a secret building, you know, tucked away in an alley. No, it's going to be mainstream witchcraft mainstream divination mainstream consulting of familiar spirits mainstream sacrifice of humans <laughs> these last days are going to be strange and perilous times men should be lovers of themselves the bible promises these are all abomination and they are to be removed god says in verse 13 thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. And by complete opposite, these practices need to be far without you. They need to be far away from you. Be perfect with God. Be with Him and complete with Him. One day, God will be perfect with us, okay? So we will eventually be with God. He desires that we would seek after being per perfect with Him these days, okay? Um, Deuteronomy 18, and in verse 15... We start reading where it says, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. I believe it's a, a little bit of a parallel here, like unto Moses, but also just like unto the Lord thy God. He's saying, he's saying that there will be a prophet that ye shall hearken unto raised up in the last days. What we have is, if you would, you can go to Acts, keep your finger there, Acts chapter 3 and verse 22, Acts chapter 3 and verse 22. And I just want to show you where, where this came to pass, or it was at least brought up again in the New Testament, this prophet that is raised up. Be perfect with the Lord thy God, because one day, as he's promising in the very next chapter, or the very next verse, he's going to be perfect with us. There will be a prophet raised up like unto me, God promises. Here in Acts chapter 3, and in verse 22, the Bible says, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Connecting this, of course, to Jesus Christ as he arrives in the scene. Acts chapter 7 and verse 37. Acts chapter 7 and verse 37. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. Continuing, and you can go back. Just, I'll mention it then. John chapter 1. You can go back to uh, Deuteronomy. John chapter 1. You'll find John the Baptist coming and proclaiming this of that prophet. And actually he's asked many times, Art you Elias? Art thou um, the Christ, are you that prophet? And they're always referring back to this prophet here of Deuteronomy, the prophet that shall be raised up unto me. Philip, there in John chapter 1, also 
he cried out unto his brethren, he said, the prophet, that prophet is here. And, and that's what he said when he was running to Jesus and bringing others with him. And so this is clearly connecting the, the New Testament, giving us, giving us affirmation of that to Christ. The Lord thy God will raise up a prophet like unto me. Him shall ye hearken. Unto him shall ye hearken. Verse 16, it says, According to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. So many recognized, I believe, in the New Testament of that prophecy coming to pass. Um, they knew of a long-awaited prophet. They knew that Christ would come. And these are just a handful that we're looking at of the prophecies on Christ that have come to pass. God arrived to answer their prayer that they would hear not the voice of the Lord thy God in that same way. In other words, Father God thundering from the mountaintop, burning it with fire at his very presence. They cried out, and said they didn't want to hear that anymore. Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, that I die not for fear. And instead, he sends a prophet, so that the word of God would still carry forth. Verse 17, it says, And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I command him. And of course, the Lord came, and he was the very word of God. Speaking the word of God, there was no difference. I think it was just a, a nicer package for them. They saw Christ, who wasn't over much beautiful. He was a humble in appearance and in, and in stature and in, in his and his, his gait, as it were, and, and, and it wasn't the same thundering from the mountaintop, burning with fire kind of presence. But nevertheless, the Lord still had his message going forth. Now, this prophet is Christ. This prophet absolutely is not Muhammad. This prophet is absolutely not Joseph Smith. This prophet is absolutely not Ellen G. White, though all of them have taken claim to that prophecy and made it their own. The prophet Muhammad, again, we can look at this portion of scripture and see that it couldn't have been him. The prophecy is that he would be like unto me. In other words, he would follow the way. He would be of that Levitical tribe. He would, he would move in the same way and manner that I have set forth, and he wouldn't do after the abominations of the nations that came before them. The prophet Muhammad, consulter with familiar spirits. He was so deranged in his cave talking to bones and writing on them that he thought to himself he was demon-possessed and it took his Catholic wife convincing him, no, 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 an angel is speaking unto you. You're getting revelations from God to kind of bring him back to some semblance of sanity and start his death cult known as Islam. Joseph Smith, a charmer and a diviner. I don't know if you know of him, but he... He, he cried out, is there, is there no help for the, the widow's child as he was being shot to death in prison? That's an old Masonic symbol for help me, brethren. And they weren't going to help him. They were so hacked off at him for all that he had done in order to steal Masonic teachings and bring them into his new religion, Mormonism. He had given up enough secrets and it was time for him to die. He had broken blood oaths and so they destroyed him as a result. Joseph Smith was a swindler and a liar. Joseph Smith talked into his hat in order to get revelations uh, from people long before he became this Christian minister. He was swindling people out of their money by divining, by soothsaying, and by being a charmer, right? You know, handsome and smart and intelligible and trying to basically use car salesman people out of their money. That's all that this guy was. And his religion was non no different. And he used Masonic rituals, he used Masonic symbols in that, and you can find it this day, look at any of the temples, and they're just adorned with Masonic weird types of, of caricatures and, and statues and what have you. That's Joseph Smith. So, of course, he could not be that prophet, not following the way of God, but rather teaching after and following after, learning of and doing the abominations of the nations that God casts out. Ellen G. Wright, a necromancer, spent the entirety of her ministry as a Seventh-day Adventist founder, talking to her dead husband and consulting with him as he led her along the way. All sorts of weird kind of revelations she had as she was, as she was uh, 
going into trances and, and, and directly speaking these books that somebody else would write down or automatic writing as it were going into a trance and just having her pen move and then there's some of her special books of course not the prophet like unto the Lord God though they try to take that to themselves all of these are abominable false prophets all of these are wicked people that have started wicked religions that we are still dealing with today but I believe we have the same commands from God learn not after their ways in other words we don't go and look at the Mormons and say hey they have a pretty good way of outreach let's follow after their ways we don't go looking at the Seventh-day Adventists and say you know what it'd be a lot easier if we just met on Sunday and start learning after different Sabbath teachings we don't follow after the Mohammedites and putting all of our women in tents and, and, and saying that that's modesty we don't do after their ways. We should shun these ways. We should put them far from us because they are abomination. And unfortunately, they're also those that do them that are abomination. Now, your average Mormon, your average Muslim, your average Seventh-day Adventist, they're not awful, reprobate, wicked people by and large. The leaders, of course, are, and it's the leaders that are pulling the strings, and unfortunately, it's the leaders of these death cults that are going to lead those poor souls to hell. But it's our responsibility to go and try to pull them out of the fire. But if any of you have engaged with any of those groups, the Mohammedites, the Smithites, the LNG Whiteites, right? If you've ever engulfed, in, engaged with any of those cults, like we did at Seventh-day Adventist just the other day, they are a tough nut to crack because they are brainwashed because this is a spiritual possession that they're under. They are under spiritual bondage. They are entrapped in those demonic things because look, those groups at the highest level are charming, divining, enchanting witches. Charming, divining, enchanting, consulters with familiar spirits, necromancers, the highest of the highest of dark arts are going on in the, in the recesses of those buildings, and that's what's trapping their people. We rely on the Word of God, the Spirit of God that's above all things, of course, has more power than any of that garbage, but we also trust that the free will of men is going to be what connects with the Spirit of God. And so we don't charm people into accepting the gospel we don't try to manipulate people into accepting it. it wouldn't work it's always based on free will and it's always based on someone just receiving a gift but it's amazing how nobody receives the gift very few people receive the gift they'd rather get trapped up in some sort of some sort of spiritual bondage and spiritual um trickery that's going on in these groups and it's it's a it's a sad crying shame but that's what God promises. And this is why it's so important and why God says, stay away from these things. In other words, you shouldn't be taking part in Christian yoga. It's the same thing. You shouldn't be taking part in Christian, you know, whatever. These, these I don't know, there's all sorts of things. We could be here all day. <clears throat> People like to Christianize some of these demonic practices. And this is, this is a problem. It's a big problem. Continuing on. We're clearly not to hearken unto these, because that's what it says in verse 19. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. And it's clear that each one of these cult leaders and founders did not hearken unto the word of God. And God's required it of them even now. In hell they lift up their eyes, being in torments. Continue on in verse 20. It says, but the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. So presumptuous is also uh, self-willed, is, is, is when someone prophesies by Baal or prophesies by the devil. And that's exactly what these groups did. They presumed to speak a word in God's name. God never sent them. God never told them to say such things. But rather, they went, spoke in the name of other gods and other demons and other devils that are, have lordship over these cults. Because there's probably one God, lowercase g, over Mormonism. There's probably one God over lowercase g one lowercase g god over islam they call him allah right these are what they're speaking in the name of and god here says even that prophet shall die 
Some of them faced gruesome and brutal deaths in this life, but certainly what came after was far, far worse. Now dead in hell, they lift up their eyes, of course, being in torments. Verse 21, And if thou shalt say in thine heart, How shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So in other words, when they speak about something coming to pass and it doesn't, they're obviously not of God because God's always going to reveal things and they will come to pass perfectly. But the Bible also re records in another place, I think back in Deuteronomy chapter 13, it says sometimes these prophets will also speak that which comes to pass. And the tell there is, well, did they tell you afterwards to go and seek after gods? And that's what happens. They get hold of a familiar spirit. They tell you, oh, such and such is going to happen. The devils are set loose. They go and manipulate things and cause that event to happen to a person. And then they say, yeah, go serve other gods because this is the God that gave me power to do that. This is the God that led me to be able to give you that new car, as I promised, and all these things. you got to be careful when prophecies come to pass. We need to try the spirits, because there's many spirits that are not of God. Try the spirits. Determine whether or not it's God that's speaking to you. And the easiest way, you hear a revelation from God, you have something impressed on your heart, go to the Word. It will never contradict the Word of God. It will only affirm the Word of God. If God's going to speak to us in last days by impressions, be immediately doubtful of it. Because God has given you everything that you need to live your life according to His will. So don't go and seek after visions. Don't go and seek after auditory voices. Don't, don't give yourself any opportunity to go through this. And, 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 be, and be tripped up and be, be destroyed as a result of following after a voice that was not God. Know the voice of the shepherd. Here it is, King James Bible, 66 books. You have enough there to get everything you need. Okay, The book is filled with good teachings and doctrine and will lead you and guide you into all truth. And God will show himself strong through it and he will lead you according to his will. And we're not supposed to even go after God in the way that we just go, oh God, where should I go next? Where should I go next? Remember what we talked about a few weeks ago, being in the way the Lord led me. You, you just do what you think is right in these days and you just, you just have a heart that's receptive to God and God essentially just works right alongside you. He doesn't often, and I, I've, I've very rarely had God say, okay, you got to go to this place. There's been an impression in my heart, and I said, okay, I think I should go to this place, and being in that way, the Lord led me. Sometimes the way is just going to your job day in, day out, and working hard. Sometimes the way is just leading your family day in, day out. And being in that way, God will lead you. He'll get on board with the plan, and then He will cause things to come to pass. But don't go and seek after other voices. Don't go and try to get some other spirit to reveal some things to you. You have enough here. Don't be caught. And also, the Bible says, Thou shalt not be afraid of, so don't get tripped up by it, but also don't fear these lying, deceiving spirits in the last days. God is going to speak, and what God says will follow. And everything that follows will ultimately lead to Christ. So we need to not not be be thinking that there's something else that's going to go on there's something else christ set forth the example follow christ's example and just put other things away put them out god god here is clear hey those things are abomination if it's not my way it's abomination there's no new thing under the sun when it comes to worshiping the god of the bible in spirit and in truth he's given it all to us let's just try our best to stick with that and trust that being in that way the lord will lead us and that's the best way that we can live our lives. And I believe that God's very clearly highlighting that. The priests, the Levites, that tribe had a way, had a manner about them. There would be a prophet like unto me. Him shall ye hearken unto. And he's going to reveal all the same things that Moses has already been teaching to the people. Hearken unto the words or else it will be required of you. And you don't want to pay that price that is being required of those that are following after familiar spirits. Christians can still be and are susceptible to getting tripped up through necromancers, getting tripped up by charmers, getting tripped up by witches and, and these types of things. You can't be demonically possessed if the Spirit of God dwells within you, but you certainly can be demonically oppressed 
And I think it's just as bad. <laughs> There's obviously no end to it where you're destroyed and go to hell for all eternity. But certainly your life can be ruined if you get caught up in these types of abominable customs of the nations, of the world which is around you. Come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you and shall be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons. That's what we want. We want that kind of closeness with God. We don't want to get caught up in uncleanness that this world has to offer. Amen?